Today we're going to talk about starting the Piper Meridian's PT6 engine. This is not simply a video of a pilot pushing buttons. In this video, I'll take you through the start procedure one step at a time, emphasizing the most important aspects, and in particular, what you must do to avoid a hot start. I will explain what we're looking for at each stage of the start. Finally, I'll explain what to do when things go wrong and definitely what not to do. So let's go right to the airport and get started. So the first thing we want to do is consider whether the airplane needs to be pointed into the wind. And let's take a break right here and talk about why that's important and when it's important. We prefer that the airplane is positioned so that the wind doesn't interfere with the flow of combustion gases from the exhaust pipes. If the exhaust is impeded by the wind, it will take longer for the gas generator to reach idle speed and consequently the peak ITT will be higher. You'll also run your starter a bit longer. These are probably not problems if you have a healthy battery, but if the battery is marginal, why introduce an additional burden? If your battery runs down because you're fighting the wind, and if consequently the gas generator isn't able to stabilize at idle, you will have a hung start, and if you don't shut it down, you may have a hot start. Whether you should turn the plane into the wind depends on both battery health and the strength of the wind, and it's really a judgment call. But one thing that helps me to decide to turn the plane around is if the wind is turning the prop backwards. That's probably a strong enough wind to think about whether the battery is healthy enough. Don't, we don't have to worry about the wind today because it's calm. So we're all set. Time to get in the plane and start it. Final check for chocks, pitot covers, other covers, all good. Before we begin, let me say a few words about the checklist. When you're starting the PT-6, it's a very high value engine and it needs to be done right or it's a very expensive mistake. So I have a checklist that I made and when I get to the engine start point, it becomes a do list. And I know a lot of people have talked about flows versus checklists versus do lists, but I'm telling you, when I start this engine, I am starting it exactly the way it, it is laid out in my do list. Forgetting one item could be a $500,000 mistake. So we have to proceed very carefully and methodically. Good. All right, ready to begin. We'll set the parking brake and we'll verify everything is off and everything is exactly where we want it prior to beginning the start sequence. So it's we want maximum airflow through the combustion chamber for cooling and we want the compressor to spin up as fast as possible so we don't run down the battery and we don't overheat the starter motor. Turn off all unneeded electrical accessories so that the starter gets all the current. Turn off bleed air so that all compressor air is dedicated to the start. Gear selector is down. We've already verified that all our switches are off, but final check of that. Also, environmental system needs to be off. This is off. Air manual override in the stowed and locked position. Power control lever, idle. Condition, cut off. Circuit breakers, check all the circuit breakers. They all look good. And we're starting a G1000 NXI system. So we have a crew alerting system. It's gonna be important to the start. Uh, let's turn on the battery. And what I look for when I turn on the battery is, what is the battery voltage? Because that's so important. And we'll digress and talk about why that's important. When talking about battery health, there are two related battery concepts we need to understand, capacity and state of charge. Capacity is the maximum amount of usable energy your battery is capable of storing. It diminishes as the years go by. It's as if your battery were growing smaller as it ages, like a bottle that holds less and less water. And what is happening internally is that the useful area of the plates is growing smaller owing to compounds building up on the surfaces of the plates. Unfortunately, we cannot directly measure battery capacity in the airplane. 
The second concept is state of charge, which is the amount of charge in the battery relative to the total that the battery can hold. An old battery will hold less charge. Nevertheless, we can charge it up to whatever maximum it can hold in its diminished capacity. And the state of charge is how fully the battery is charged relative to the diminished capacity. By observing battery voltage, we could get an idea of the state of charge. There are three measurements of battery voltage of importance. First is open circuit voltage. This is the voltage on the battery with no load. You need a meter hooked up to your battery with no other load to measure open circuit voltage. Here's how to do that. You can measure open circuit voltage at your battery minder connector. All you need is a voltmeter. Open circuit voltage is dependent on temperature and it's typically 26 volts and if it is cold the voltage will be a bit higher. This battery is showing 27 volts. If it is hot, the voltage will be lower. Second is the voltage with a small load, and this is the voltage you read on the panel when you turn on the battery. You want it to be 24 volts or more, which indicates a charged battery, although in some cases 23.5 volts may be acceptable. But note, this voltage only tells you the battery is charged. It does not tell you that the battery contains enough juice to complete the start, so you still must be vigilant during the start. The third voltage is the lowest voltage the battery drops to under the initial and heavy load of the starter, what some call the dip voltage. Opinions differ on what the minimum allowable dip voltage is, but if you monitor dip voltage from start to start, you can develop a sense of whether the battery is deteriorating. Of course, you won't be measuring dip voltage on a 1945 Simpson panel meter. You'll be measuring it on whatever the voltmeter is that's installed in your panel. To recap, what you want to do when you're ready to push the start button is to make sure that the voltage is at least 23.5 volts and preferably more than 24 volts. If you're starting with a marginal battery under 24 volts, always remember that if anything should go wrong, always move the condition lever to cut off without delay. That's good advice for any start, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get back to our start. A battery voltage is shown here. So I'm going to be watching this as we start. We're starting at 24.9, that's fine. My crew alerting system messages have come alive. So now we're ready to start the engine. Let's do the fire detection test. And now we're going to act, begin the start and we're going to do everything exactly as it says on the checklist. Number one, fuel and ignition need to be in the manual position. Pause. System test OK. Good. Now we check the crew alerting system to make sure that fuel pumps are on and the ignition is on. Now we're going to go forward with the start. We're going to start, do the auto start. We're going to look for oil pressure rising. And when NG uh, reaches 13%, we add fuel and we make sure that the ITT doesn't ex exceed uh, the red lines. Let's take a step back and review what we are looking for on the start and why. First, let's confirm the pumps and the ignition are on. Skipping the ignition has led to expensive trouble for more than one PT6 operator when ignition was turned on out of sequence. More about that later. I'm emphasizing it now because it can be an expensive mistake. Usually, we want to start in automatic mode. Look at the start mode switch. The LED should not be on. If it is on, push the mode switch to go back to automatic mode, indicated by the LED being off. In auto mode, we are engaging a relay that controls the starter motor. This relay should disengage automatically when NG reaches 56%. In Auto start mode, we simply lift the cover and push start and let go. The relay engages to power the starter. In manual mode, we would need to hold the start button down. It's important to understand that in either auto or manual mode, all the start button does is power the starter motor. It does not control fuel pumps, fuel shutoff, ignition. If you push stop, you only stop the starter motor, nothing else. Once we've pushed start, I like to watch the voltage to see how far it dips under the load of the starter. If you keep track of dip voltage, you can determine if your battery is aging. 
As discussed earlier, a dip voltage below 17 volts is reason to be very careful. You may not have enough reserve to reach a stable start. Next, watch the oil pressure. You want to see it increasing, not remaining zero. Then focus on NG. You must have sufficient gas generator speed before you add fuel because airflow is essential for keeping a cool start. If the engine is hot, before you add fuel, make sure ITT has dropped below 140 C. It will drop as NG increases, so be patient. It only takes a few extra seconds if your battery is healthy. Once all the conditions are met, move the condition lever to run. In meridians, the condition lever only has two positions, run and stop. There is no in-between. It is not a mixture control, so move it smartly to run and wait for ignition. Take a look at the fuel flow. It should not be more than 130 pounds per hour. If the flow is significantly above 130, abort unless you know your engine extremely well and you know the peak ITT to expect. You'll hear ignition and see the ITT start to rise. Once the fuel is burning, the gas generator will speed up and fuel pressure will automatically increase. And when fuel pressure is sufficient, at about 38% NG, the second ring of fuel injectors will add fuel and fuel flow should rise. While all this is happening, watch ITT to make sure it stays within limits. We'll talk about aborting the start when things go wrong later. As a normal start continues, we want to make sure ITT stabilizes in the green arc. NG should reach and exceed 56%. At 56%, the starter motor should disengage. If you are using manual start mode, let go of the start button at 56% NG. Verify that the starter has disengaged on the crew alert system or on your enunciator panel. The engine should stabilize at idle with ITT and NG in the green. Now let's get back to the airport and an actual start. So here we go. Eighteen point five from my dip on the voltage. Oil pressure is alive. RPMs coming up. Add fuel. Watching the ITT here. Seven twenty is my maximum temperature. That's a good start. Now I'm watching to make sure that the starter disengages automatically. It did. Once that happens, we can turn on the alternator generator, maybe on it. Okay. Oil pressure is over 60. Maybe on it is on. Lead air in. It's yes, normal. That's basically the start. Up till now, we've been talking about a battery start. And now we'd like to provide a few tips about using a ground power unit. It is largely the same process, but before you allow the GPU to be plugged in, there are a few things you should do. First, agree on hand signals with the line crew, especially important for connection and disconnection from the GPU. Also, make sure the GPU is set for 28 volts and can deliver 1200 amps. Too much voltage will fry your electronics. I know of one Meridian where the repairs from a GPU error were in the six figures. Also make sure everything in the airplane is off before the card is connected because attaching the GPU is exactly like turning on the battery and you don't want any de-ice heaters on. Finally, the POH recommends that the battery be off until just before you're ready to disconnect from the GPU. Some experienced Meridian pilots advise turning on the battery just before you push the start button. The reason is that if the GPU should fail during the start, you could end up with a hot start. If the battery is turned on right before the start button is pressed, it will continue the start if the GPU fails. If your battery is weak, then you could turn on the battery as soon as the GPU is connected in order to let the GPU charge the battery. But yes, this is contrary to the POH, so use your judgment. You may want to stick with the POH since OFF is in bold and underlined just inside the GPU access door. Finally, make sure by using hand signals that the GPU access door is closed. If the ground crew leaves the door open, it will probably be damaged or lost in flight. Now let's talk about where things go wrong. This is very important because handling an unusual condition incorrectly can result in an expensive repair. 
Take a look at this turbine wheel. It was damaged in a hot start. I don't know what it costs to repair this wheel, but the blades are roughly $1,800 each, and there are three wheels, two that drive the prop and one that drives the compressor section. We could be talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's jump back in the airplane to reinforce one more point. Let me also just mention the ways at hand for stopping the engine. When we're stopping the engine, the, the power control lever should be at idle. And to stop the engine, we pull the condition lever all the way back. That should do it. But if it doesn't, we also have fuel shutoff valve. Lift the cover, pull off, and that will shut off the fuel. And if the engine has to be shut down quickly, fuel first, get, it, get the fuel off. Let's begin with what happens if you don't get the fire st started. In other words, you don't see any signs of combustion within 10 seconds. Something is clearly wrong. Maybe you've skipped the step, such as forgetting to turn on the ignition. In that case, you've filled the engine with a lot of fuel and air, and now is not the time to turn on the ignition. If you do recognize the mistake and turn on the ignition, you'll probably be replacing parts. The correct remedy is to cut off the fuel Stop the start by going to the manual start mode, the LED will light, and the starter motor will stop running because in manual mode, the starter will only run with your finger holding down the start button. Shut everything down, then figure out what went wrong. Follow the POH instructions, which are basically to let the plane sit for 30 seconds to let the fuel drain, then dry motor the engine for 15 seconds, then start over. Anytime you don't like what you see on the ITT gauge, pull the condition lever to cut off. That is your move. You can then stop the start process by hitting the run stop switch, uh, but always cut off the fuel first. If the engine is running and NG has reached 56%, but the starter remains engaged, simply depress the manual stop switch to put the starter control circuit in manual mode. As mentioned before, in manual mode, the starter can only run if the push start button is held. So selecting manual mode disengages the starter. We mentioned earlier that we should check fuel flow after the condition lever is advanced. The normal range of fuel flow is 95 to 120 pounds per hour. The higher the initial fuel flow, the higher the peak ITT. Fuel flow of 120 pounds per hour may put the ITT in the yellow range momentarily. And this is okay if you are very familiar with your engine and you know that ITT is not going to exceed one of the ITT limitations, the most important of which is 1000 degrees C for 5 seconds when starting. There are also transient limits which are 850 degrees C for 12 seconds and 880 for 5 seconds. And it's best to stay out of the yellow arc if you can. If you find that your starts are consistently in the yellow and near these limits, it'd be wise to note the fuel flow and consult with your mechanic. A final note about manual override. It is not used in the engine start process and generally should not be used on the ground. It's for emergency use in the air, not for start, not for taxi. Make sure it is locked in the off position before you start the engine. Once you have the engine running and stable, you are out of danger of a financial disaster and you can have a great flight.